of all the writing I've done in the last 35 or 40 years, um, this, uh, the articles and the book I've done on history myths has been the most fun. And I'm really happy to be here today because it was inspired by an exhibit that was here in 2006 uh, on history myths of the DAR collection. It was more specific to the DAR collection. But I was visiting, I saw this exhibit, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could come up with a few myths that pertain more widely to a lot of different museums. And I could write an article about that for the Colonial Williamsburg Magazine. And I did. In 2008, I wrote an article about myths that are widely um, repeated at uh, museums and historic sites and national parks and walking tours and bus tours and carriage tours, the like, uh, such as houses didn't have closets back then because people wanted to avoid paying the closet tax. Who's heard of that one? Here's a closet in the 1750 George Wythe House in Williamsburg. Or African-American quilts are really secret codes meant to guide escaping slaves through the Underground Railroad. How many have heard that? Yes. Or the ever popular, people didn't bathe back then. Who's heard that one? Uh, and, and there, of course, is an antique bathtub. Um, the article I wrote had a very good response, and people were requesting more. And so in 2010, I wrote a second article and started a, posting them on a blog. So if you want, I have. I, I wondered at the time if I might find, you know, a dozen or so. I now have, I think, 147 um, myths that have been collected over the years. And if you want to find any of them, please take a look at that address. Um, after I collected so many, I talked to people at Colonial Williamsburg, and we started um, an idea of co of collecting a few of them and putting them in a book. And then that's what we get death by Petticoat. That came out in 2012. Um, but today we're just going to focus on the myths that pertain directly to women. First I want to say that history myths is not the same as history mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, myths seek to explain something. I always use the example of Apollo driving his chariot of the sun across the sky, which is explaining to the ancient Greeks how the sun moved around the world. Um, but having said that, some myths are based on mistakes, such as this one. Um, women secluded themselves indoors during pregnancy. This is said sometimes about colonial women, sometimes about 19th century women, but whenever it's said, um, it's not true. First of all, the majority of women couldn't afford to do that. The majority of women are working women. They have to be out and have to be have to be working. Uh, the wealthy few who really could theoretically have stayed inside, why would they want to? Uh, in fact, we have many letters from the colonial and the 19th century period that, that are pregnant women writing about how they went to church, they went to a party, they went to friends, they, they were out shopping, they were moving around, they, they weren't staying home. So where, where does this come from? Where, is the, where, does, where did this start? Um, I, I'm not sure, but I have an idea that maybe we could thank Margaret Mitchell in Gone with the Wind, because uh, in her book, which was published in 1936, there are three or four mentions of Scarlett or Melanie not le being leaving the house because they were pregnant, which is crazy, as they would have. But start with the title here. Um, what does the title of the book mean? The first, it's the first myth in the book. Uh, so, so many colonial women died when their long skirts or petticoats caught fire at the hearth. It was the leading cause of death for women. Who's heard of that one? A lot of Nor New England uh, kitchen museums uh, are, are mention this a lot. It's a huge, huge exaggeration. Sadly, some women did die uh, from burns, and so did some men, and so did some children. Uh, it tended to involve excessive alcohol consumption. What was the leading cause of death for women? Disease. Disease, yes. That's, uh, that's also another myth, that, that childbirth was, was the leading cause of death. So why do these myths appeal to us? Um, probably 
Some of them make us feel sort of superior when we, when we hear them, such as this one. Cooks in the Middle Ages, or cooks in colonial America, or whatever, um, cooks used spices to mask the flavors or the odors of rotting meat. Who's heard of that? I've heard that a lot in kitchens. Okay, first of all, this is a little bit illogical. Spices um, came from very, very far away from the so-called Spice Islands, which we would call Indonesia today, the uh, East Indies. They were extremely expensive. Only the very wealthiest people for centuries could afford spices. These are not the sort of people who are eating rotten meat. There's no way that they're using precious spices to put on rotten meat. But oddly enough, the subject of history myths has also been the most controversial uh, of the subjects that I've ever written about, which surprised me because I've written about some pretty controversial things. But I didn't expect this, but I believe it's partly because people are wedded to their myths and don't want them debunked, and especially when ego or money are involved. So let's deal with money first. How about this one? People bought their tea in bricks, not loose leaves, and used the bricks as currency. Now, you reenactors, you hear this in uh, some of the sutlers who will tell you this in, in reenactments, and I believe they're the ones who started it not too long ago. Um, it depends on which sort of people you're talking about. If you're talking about Tibetan people, yes, this is true. But if you're talking about American people, no. There was never any, any documentation of a tea brick ever in the United States, in colonial America or early America. Um, bricks of tea do date from as early as 733 AD, uh, according to the Victoria and Albert um, Museum research on the subject of tea. But that was in China. And when bricks of tea were used and to carry to Tibet, it's still hard to get to Tibet today. And when you're, you're going, tea was easier carried in bricks and by porters through the mountains. And they were used as some form of currency because they were valuable, just like you might use deer skins or something else as a kind of loose currency. But Americans used tea in their, its loose leaf form, which they stored in tea chests or canisters, sometimes locked it up with the key because it was so costly. The myth about tea bricks seems to um, be very important to sutlers because they sell so much of it to um, the reenacting crowd, and they don't want to stop. They're making too much money. But then that gets the woman who's making the tea over the fire, and the, and the, uh, <clears throat> the visitors come along, <clears throat> and they start talking about tea bricks. And so that's how it's unfortunately spreading. Um, some myths get started by suggestion, such as, what? We're, not that one yet. Um, Petticoat mirrors are tables with mirrors underneath, and they were built to allow women to make sure their petticoats weren't showing. Has anybody heard this? Mm. The correct name for these is pier tables, P-I-E-R, and it was intended for the space between windows. That's called the pier, like you put one there. And they were either um, um, decorative, or you put a mirror above it or below it to reflect the light in, in the room. But this, this is also sort of illogical because in those days, a petticoat wasn't some elastic band slip that could fall down that you would actually see showing. Um, a petticoat was sewn into your, your waistband, or in the colonial era, it might actually show, uh, like, the, like the first illustration on the book, it, it, could, it could be decorative with an open, open dress and the petticoat would show in the front. Um, and there were costume docents here at the DAR some years ago, and also in Claremont, New York, tried to see with their costume if you could step back and see your petticoat, and they couldn't because the distance was too short it, it, to put them in the hall. You could not get back far enough to even see your hem, hem line, so it didn't work for practical reasons. Now, some myths are half-truths, like... People didn't smile in photographs because of the long exposure times required. I believe, I've heard that for years, and I certainly believed it. And it's true to some degree. It's just not the only truth. 
Um, it's, it is harder to hold a smile, you know, for, do you have to wait one whole minute or two minutes for, for a, the long exposure time? Yes, it, it is harder. But that's, the more important reason is cultural. Um, Mark Twain probably expressed it best when he said, a photograph is a most important document and there is nothing more damning to go down to posterity than a silly, foolish smile, caught and fixed forever. <laughs> so you look back at, at painted portraiture, which is the tradition that photographs came from. Go through any museum and look at the older portraits, uh, any art gallery, and you'll see that a broad smile has never been fashionable in, in painted portraiture. It is now cheese, but no, it, it's not something that people did. Why? It's just not dignified. It didn't, you, if you were having your portrait painted, it was an important event. And as Mark Twain says, it's not, it's, it's such undignified. Uh, one Cambridge University lecturer wrote, by the 17th century in Europe, it was a well-established fact. The only people who smiled broadly in life or in art were the poor, the lewd, the drunk, the innocent, and entertainers. So you're, you're not any of those, you're not going to give a big, a big smile. So another half-truth myth, women ate arsenic to lighten their complexions. Well, unlike today when everybody's trying to get a little bit of tan on their skin, uh, in previous centuries uh, women felt pale was prettier because it, it indicated that you were more upper class, you didn't have to labor in the field like a peasant. So you, you, know, you would want to show a whiter, whiter skin. Um, there is some evidence that women ate arsenic to minimize blemishes, but according to the 18th century apothecary specialist, uh, Robin Kipps in Colonial Williamsburg, arsenic actually darkens the skin. So if you were doing this, you would soon find that it wasn't working the way you wanted it and you would stop. But it was sold for many years. I saw an ad in the 1902 Sears Roebuck catalog for arsenic wafers. Wow. So you would take it to clear up your complexion, men and women, you know, to clear up your complexion. Um, it wasn't really for whitening. Um, but some women did something else that was just as bad and well, no, worse, really. Since the early 1500s, a few upper, very upper class European women think Queen Elizabeth I and her court, you know, would uh, use a skin whitener called Ceruse, C-E-R-U-S-E, -E, you know that, that? It's lead, white lead. And that's what, you know, when you see those <coughs> strange looking pictures of Queen Elizabeth with that white, white face, um, and this probably did cause damage. If you used it enough, it certainly could have caused death. Uh, if it was still available in France and still used to some degree in the 1700s, but never in America. So. How do myths spread? Um, visitors bring them. You all, anybody who's been a tour guide knows visitors will ask you about them. Uh, and they spread from word, uh, word of mouth, from docent to docent. Uh, they're often spread in museums where training and um, supervision are poor. And let's all face it, museums don't have tons of money for training and supervision, so that's, you know, it's understandable. Um, and they're particularly, particularly uh, frequent on city bus tours, walking tours, horse, horse and carriage tours, ghost tours, and where honestly the, the emphasis here is on entertainment over education. They're there to make you laugh, scare you, you know, make you giggle about something. They're not really there to educate you. And so they, they don't really want to stop telling, telling myths. Um, the other source is the internet. I mean, how, surely you've all gotten these crazy, you know, this is why raining cats and dogs means putting your cat and dog in the, you know, up, up on the roof. Or, I don't know, insane. I, you, you must get those. <laughs> I know, aren't they? I know, I know, I know. They don't stage fire. I know, I know. Have you, have you ever tried to put a cat? Yes, on put it. Yeah, and make them and make them stay there. That's right. My yes, there, there are lots. Um, myths are often created when we apply today's logic to the past, such as 
Women dipped their hems in water when working around fires to keep their skirts from catching fire. This is kind of related to the death by petticoat um, example, but reenactors tell me they get this question all the time when they're working around a campfire. Um, onlookers will ask whether their hems are wet. Um, and costumed interpreters like this woman would hear, hear them when they're working in a kitchen. Has anybody ever gotten this question from people? No? Well, generally speaking, um, it's only the formal wear that was ever long enough to drag on the ground that most women's clothing, whatever century you're talking about, was several inches above the ground, and it, it was not going to get, you know, get, get up by the fire very easily. Um, let's see. Oh, and another point worth noting, reenactors have known for decades that uh, when back in the 70s when we had synthetic fabrics and people started to use synthetics uh, for, for costume in interpreters and they found out that those were very dangerous because the flame from a candle or a fire ca does cause those, they melt. I mean they really can, can you, you look like you've had some experience, yeah. It, they, they can be very dangerous. Um, the, Natural fabrics, wools and uh, cottons and linens in particular, don't burst into flame when they come in contact with, with fire. They smolder, but they don't go you know, like that. Like, so it's really safer to wear. You, know, you can put out anything fairly quickly. Uh, myths can also be created when we apply a truth from one time or place to another time or place where it's not true, such as the Tibet uh, uh, tobacco. I mean, uh, tea leaves. Uh, another one example is taverns. Women were not allowed in taverns. Or something similar, women were not allowed to use the front door of taverns. Well, this myth probably began when people assumed that practices from the late 19th century had always been the case or had originated earlier. Um, and it's true in the colonial period, women didn't go into taverns all that often because they didn't travel all that often because they were usually pregnant or nursing or whatever. Um, but there are many documented instances of people, women, spending the night in a tavern. And being the tavern had the biggest rooms around, that's where your entertainment would take place, your balls or your um, gatherings or lectures or things like that. And women certainly went to those. Um, some taverns were owned and operated by women, including this one in Williamsburg. There were at least two taverns that were, were operated by women tavern keepers. Um, though this is patently false, the custom of a separate ladies' entrance does date from the late Victorian era, where in some of the more urban, urban American hotels um, found that they could appeal to that genteel lady client by having a separate entrance, maybe a separate ladies' waiting room. And it's true that some Wild West saloons, or many saloons, uh, women were certainly discouraged from, from going in. They would often go in the back to buy beer or well, liquor or whatever they wanted and take it home. But these were, these were working class, lower class women. But they went in, but that practice wasn't necessarily the practice in the colonial era. Some myths can be traced to a simple understanding of a word. They're called sad irons because ironing was such a hated chore that any woman would be sad to iron. <laughs> a sad iron is one type of iron. There are many others. Uh, they're gophering irons, they're box irons, whatever. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary is a tremendous source if you're ever trying to get to the bottom of something that involves word language use, because it records the first known instance of, a, of that word in, used in writing. You never know when it was first used in speaking, but it first used in writing. Um, and when I looked at the Oxford English Dictionary, it said the word sad once meant heavy or compact. So a sad iron is one that's solid. A box iron is a box you put the coals in it uh, to heat it. This you heat it on the stove. So sad irons were the heavy iron that you would use. And as sad as many of us are to spend time ironing, that's not how the word got started. And another example of that word usage problem is 
<clears throat> prostitutes were so common around Union General Joseph Hooker's army that they became known as hookers. Well, this is true, but that's not where the word comes from. Um, these women were sometimes called Hooker's Division or Hooker's Brigade, but the fly in the ointment here is the Oxford English Dictionary that can date this word as early as 1567 to meaning prostitute. Hooker and prostitute were the petty thief, a petty thief or a prostitute, because a prostitute stole from you as, uh, while she was doing other things. So um, in America, the synonym it goes back at least to the 1800s, and it, it probably evolved from the conventional sense of hook, you know, hooking, taking, you know. And interestingly, um, in French, uh, the, a, a man who, a pimp, a man who uh, stands outside the brothel and tries to get people to come in is called an accrocheur, a hooker. He's hooking the people, and what do you call crochet, hook? You know, it's the, from the French word, too. So it was an, obviously a joke. Everybody knew that hooker was a synonym for prostitute, and so hookers, you know, everybody got the joke then. But that's not where the word came from. Some myths are just impossible. My favorites include, um, women had two or more ribs surgically removed to make their waists <laughs> smaller. This was one that I came across in the DAR exhibit in 2006 that in the, it was called myth or truth was the name of the, the the exhibit and chief curator and acting director of the museum of fashion institute of technology valerie Steele, is the author of many books on fashion and one of them the most important for my purposes is the corset a cultural history published in 2001 i'm sure there's um, yale university press has i'm sure there's a copy here and she says there is no evidence at all that this practice ever existed in reality. After years of research, uh, I have not found any 19th century medical article about this procedure. She points out that such an operation could not have been performed without putting the woman at almost certain risk of death. Chest surgery was extremely high. Anesthesia was unavailable or, or at least unknown or, or not well known, not well used. And the you know, histories of plastic surgery do not ever mention this. So it's theoretically possible today that that could be done, but Dr. John Sherman of Cornell University's medical school said no one has ever owned up to performing such a procedure. So I don't think it's ever been done, at least not in this country. Some other favorites. Women were put in the pillory for showing their ankles. Who's heard that? Yeah. <laughs> Women were put in the pillory for gossiping or slandering someone or not obeying their husbands quickly enough, but they weren't put in the pillory for showing their ankles, as again, work clothing was above the ankles and everybody's ankles showed all the time. How about people bathed once a year or people bathed in May and October? Or brides carried flowers because they had to cover up their body odor because they didn't bathe. You know. Well, personal habits are notoriously difficult to document. And I ask people, when was the last time you wrote in a diary or letter that you took a shower? I mean, you, know, you just don't do it. So if you say the verb to bathe, if that means sitting in a hot, in hot water in a big tub, yes, that it's true, people did not bathe very often. That was not really much done until the later 20th century when the miracle of indoor plumbing, when you could just turn a tap and hot water came out, for God's sake. It was such a, 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 wonder, a wonder that that's the first time that bathing in that sense uh, became common. Um, hot water, you know, pumping it, carrying it in, heating it up on the stove, carrying it upstairs, pouring it in a tub, and then reversing that procedure to carry it all back down was too much labor. Even if a, for a wealthy woman who had servants or slaves, it was just too much work to do. So men could bathe in rivers and lakes as part of you know, swimming recreation. Women seldom did that. Bathing in warm min mineral springs and seaside resorts, too, became uh, popular around the early uh, early mid 19th century, 
um, at first just for the wealthy, but later for middle classes as well. But just like today, habits varied. Some people washed daily, some people washed less. But inventories and photographs of in, in home interiors show that almost every bedchamber has a wash stand in it. People washed in their bedrooms, maybe just hands and face, maybe they stood on a, um, a, uh, uh, what a floor cloth beside the wash basin and washed standing up. Maybe they sat in a little tin tub and just got a few inches of water, um, but they bathed usually in the comfort of their room. Uh, we have a few written references to bathing. Uh, William Byrd II wrote in his book, in The History of the Dividing Line of 1741, that he was very relieved to bathe after several days in the wilderness. And Dr. Benjamin Rush, I'm sure you've all heard of him, of Philadelphia, he was writing about soldiers, but he recommended, his recommendations could apply to anyone. He said, Americans should wash hands and face at least once every day and the whole body twice or three times a week especially in summer. So this was a common, people washed. In the 19th century and early 20th century, what one thing we forget about is that people visited public baths in urban centers, towns and cities. Even a city as small as Richmond, uh, I looked into our own baths in Richmond and we had one as early as 1832, possibly earlier, but that one we know about. And there were several public baths in Richmond. It's a very small city. And until the last one closed in 1950. And that's about when uh, hot water got to just about everyone. I mean, the pub public, you know, the plumbing was, was actually uh, brought into most houses. Um, the, the one bath that, was, that closed in 1950 uh, served 60 thousand people a year. The cost in the early 1900s was five cents for adults and three cents for children. And lest you think this was some lower class thing, this is very popular with judges, doctors, lawyers, all classes of people, because it was just easier than bathing at home. So. Shower baths. The first shower bath came into play in the middle of the 19th century. I know about it because it was installed in the governor's mansion uh, so I wrote a book about the governor's mansion when it, 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 it um, had its 200th anniversary. And in the uh, 1840s, they installed a shower bath. I think mostly men would have used this and that women would probably have continued to bathe in their bedchamber. But one thing is for sure, women washed their hair less often. And that's, I mean, what most women didn't cut their hair until the 1920s and they would have it, tied or, or what, somehow uh, up and put in a cap or covered in some way because I mean, think how long it takes to dry your hair. I mean, you're going to sit by a fire or, or sit outside and, and wait in the sun and going like this and trying to dry it. It, just, it was just too much, too much to do. Um, hairstyles, uh, until the 1920s when an electric hair dryer was invented and people could have short, women could sh bob their hair Scandalous, I know, but flappers did that. Um, until the 1920s, uh, th that was the first time anybody ever started washing their hair more often when it became easier with the hair dryers and the short hair. So I always say accuracy is probably best served in this whole bathing story by saying, while people may have bathed less often, they didn't necessarily wash less often. And we use the, use the words carefully, and I think you, you are more accurate. Um, fire screens were placed between a woman and the fireplace to prevent the heat from melting her wax makeup. Heard of that one? Yeah. Um, I was thinking melting faces. It sounds like the Indiana Jones and the, the, the whatever the faces all melted reminds me of that. Um, colonial American women wore little or no makeup. And we know this because European visitors commented on it because back in Europe, in France or in England, uh, it, was, it was more common. Um, if a woman had wanted to wear makeup, she would have had to have made her own. Uh, there certainly wasn't anything uh, available. Uh, there are recipes for um, skincare 
treatments uh, in, in uh, household management books. But these were intended to be applied and then washed off, and they are usually, wax might be in those as sort of a thickener, but they are really for um, skin care. Uh, you know, everyone was obsessed with reducing freckles, um, but th this wasn't really makeup. It's, it's more like skin care. Um, American women in the Victorian times didn't wear makeup either, unless we're talking about act actresses or prostitutes, which was basically the same thing at the time. Um, and again, they may have used creams to make their skin pale or to reduce freckles, but not, not really makeup. Makeup doesn't take off until the Roaring Twenties, which is another reason I'm so interested in that era. It's such a new time with you know hair, new hairstyles, new clothing styles, new makeup. And, um, and they, it was made popular by, again, screen actresses in the silent movies appearing with makeup made it more respectable. And a, an immigrant um, who made, created his own makeup for, those, for the actresses in Los Angeles and Hollywood um, named Maximilian Faktorowicz uh, created the first line of commercial makeup. And you know, recognize who that is. Max Factor, yeah. That was the first makeup available in a store that a woman could go and actually buy, ready-made. Um, so what was the point of fire screens? When, when historians find them in, um, listed in inventories, it's really, they're kind of rare. Uh, it, it's only in inventories where um, the household is pretty wealthy and um, they, an expensive accessory like that was used to keep the heat of the fire from being too uncomfortable for you on, on your face. It wasn't for men or women or particularly, it was just for anyone to, to keep the heat off, direct heat off you. Um, and it was giving women something, upper class women, something to do making those nice needlepoint works of art. The um, effect of the History Myths book really surprised me. I expected it to sell in, in bookstores and like museum gift shops like this, but, which it does, but um, it's become a staple in um, docent training at museums, and there have been numerous conferences developed on the topic, and museum exhibits, um, like the one that was here that started the whole thing. There have been museum exhibits in North Carolina and Delaware and New York and Pennsylvania, and um, the blog subscribers is almost up to 2,000 now, and they're mostly museum people, and they make sure I don't make a mistake. <laughs> it's very, very helpful, um, because I hasten to say, I, I, am, I am not an expert. It would take one person a lifetime to really deal with a few of these myths. Uh, it's one advantage to getting older is that I know a lot of people in the museum world or curatorial world. I know where to go. Um, for answers, and I know who to ask, and I get a lifetime of experience. I can ask the question and get an answer from somebody who is, you know, the expert, and then I write that up. So uh, it's a shortcut. As far as direct research myself, I probably haven't done the research for a quarter of these myths all by myself. So, yeah. um, and it's also it makes me very glad that tour guides are becoming much more skeptical about what they hear and what they say. And I didn't really expect that. I mean, you're never going to get rid of history myths. You know, that's, that's not the goal. But just to know that people are becoming a little more careful and they're asking, um, instead of saying, well, we've always said that, well, can you, show, can you show documentation for that? Well, maybe if you can't, you should go look for documentation. And if there isn't any, maybe then you should drop it. So, and, and, and that's happening. It's, 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 so I like the museums to be more, museums need to be a, a, a more trusted, uh, we, we trust our museums to give us the facts, to give us the right, the, the true story. And we're, we're, not, um, we're not the ghost tour. You know? So, when I started down this road, I thought I would find a couple dozen myths and talking to tradesmen and tour guides and blog readers, um, I'm up to about 145, 147. If there's anything though that you've heard that isn't in the blog, let me know and I'll see if I can deal with it. Um, let's see, I have, 
was gonna, I, I can actually talk for three or four hours on this subject. <laughs> so that's the end.